We're in a series these days in the book of Philippians, and we're beginning to put down the landing gear and the wheels and the whole shoot match because we're already halfway through chapter four. Uh, After uh, this weekend, we've only got two more teachings, and then we'll wrap up this dynamic book that we've been calling Joy for the Journey. We are in chapter four of Philippians today, and we're looking at three transcendent verses, verses 10, 11, and 12, and we're gonna read those together momentarily. Take your notes. You have a hard copy option, uh, the same every week, as well as a digital uh, version uh, online, and so whatever's most convenient for you. Uh, But that being said, I want us to consider these three verses that I want us, want us to simply call enough, enough. Because it, at its essence, when you distill down everything that's being said, that's the main point, enough. Now, church is where we go to learn how to live. And life is where we go to live out what we've learned. Let me say that again. Church is where we go to learn how to live from, from the God's word. And then life is where we go to live out what we've learned. You say, John, why are you telling us this? Because most good-hearted people forget step two. If you hear and listen and learn today and then go out and do nothing about it, you'll remain unchanged. Truth does not transform until we do truth. And so I'm asking you, uh, in these three verses, these transcendent verses will transform your life and my life if we actually do them. Check them out with me, would you please? I want you to focus as we look on these verses at really the central theme as we read it together. Notice the words learning and contentment. Contentment is not something that happens automatically. Really what happens automatically for us as human beings is discontentment. We're we're not contented. So we have to learn contentment. Keeping that in mind, let's read it together. Begin. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Learning contentment. Uh, This is a true story, written in a journal by a dad named Joel uh, and his 11-year-old daughter, Kristen. Listen carefully. He writes, when my daughter was 11, we spent an afternoon at the city dump. I think that's a powerful idea. Our purpose was not to dump garbage, but to observe waste. So I backed our car up against the mounds of refuse and I placed my daughter on the roof of the car. With pen and paper in hand, I asked her to list every item that she could identify and the results were astounding. There was plastic swimming pool, a barbecue, several old lawn chairs, Barbie dolls, bicycle frames, skateboards, play refrigerators and stoves, radios, televisions, computers, everything a little girl dreams of and more. As we drove back home, we happened to pull alongside a double trailer truck and piled high atop each of those two trailers were five hunks of scrap metal bundled tightly together. Now, had you turned any of them upside down, you probably would have found made in Detroit or Tokyo or Mexico or Tennessee stamped on their underbellies. They were hardly in mint condition and yet there they were, 10 crumpled cars. Magnificent object lessons for a father and daughter who at that very moment were discussing the value of things. I can still remember leaning over and reminding my daughter that the beautiful car in which we were now riding was ultimately headed for that very same scrap heap. And that was a powerful day Kristen and I will never forget because it was a a powerful reminder that someday everything we own will also be junk. In some dump somewhere, the things that have captivated our attention and dominated our lives will smolder beneath a simmering flame amidst stinking mounds of rotting garbage. There's an assumption today uh, in our culture, it's, it's not written anywhere, but you know as a fellow American that it's true in our culture today, this generally accepted assumption that, quote, mounds of money will in fact greatly improve the quality of my life. 
We believe that assumption as Americans because we live it out. And our beliefs are not what we say they are. Our beliefs are how we live. How we actually live demonstrates what we believe, and that is what we are. Does that make sense? Now, we live in kind of a, an interesting region that's out of proportion not only to America but to the world because we live in a region of not only immense influence and ideas but a region of immense wealth. So I don't know if you caught online this week that the Bay Area is now number two on the planet for a given region that has the most billionaires. That's with a B. We now have 73 billionaires in the Bay Area. And you say, well, man, 73 is not very many. Yeah, but a billion is a lot. And we got 73 of them. That's not counting 100 millionaires and all the other things where people have an immense disproportionate amount of the planet's wealth. So this assumption of mounds of money will greatly improve the quality of our life. Here's how I think the Bible would respond to that. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That depends solely upon whether or not the person who has the mounds of money has learned the secret of contentment. Somebody said this, money isn't everything, but it does keep the kids in touch. I think I may, I may be about to learn that. <laughs> You say, John, what's going on in this passage of scripture in the fourth chapter of Philippians? Why is Paul writing this now? Two simple reasons, and they're important to remember because it gives context and setting and understanding why he's sharing these verses with us, 10, 11, and 12. First of all, Paul's still in prison, and he has just received a long-delayed financial gift from the believers in Philippi, and he's very grateful, so he's saying thank you. Uh, that's really one of the chief purposes of the whole book of Philippians. Now, um, this long-delayed financial gift from the believers in Philippi uh, did not surprise Paul for this reason. Uh, the church at Philippi, of all the New Testament churches, was the most generous church. They didn't have the most money, but they were the most financially generous church, but not just financially generous, generous in every way. That was a deep part of their DNA, and Paul's acknowledging their generosity to him with gratitude. The second reason he's writing, and this is going to kind of blow your mind, did you know that in the first century, when you were in prison, incarcerated by the government for whatever reason you broke the law, etc., the government did not meet your physical needs. They did not provide your food. They threw you in a cell, changed you to the wall, slammed the doors shut, and if you were going to have a, a bed to sleep on or a mat or a straw tick or whatever and a blanket to pull over you uh, and any food, it had to be provided by family and friends. Paul is doubly saying thank you because he is essentially implying that were it not for your generous gift, I, I would die a natural death, which he goes, actually, I'm cool with that too because I'm content whether I live, whether I die, whether I have much, whether I have little whether I'm well-fed, whether I'm hungry. It's immaterial. Circumstantially, those things are unimportant to me because I am content because the Lord is enough. So those are the two reasons that Paul is writing these three verses which you and I have just read together. I want you to notice what Paul's temporary difficult circumstances are not doing to him. They are not sending him spiraling into depression. I think that's great. Think about the circumstances you have. Is your good mood, your good days, only aligned with when good circumstances, a confluence of events, are happening good in your life, and then your bad days where everybody kind of avoids you, says, oh my gosh, something bad must have happened because here he comes, here she comes. Let's run while we can. So are you up and down like this based upon your circumstances? Paul was not spiraling into depression. He was steady as she goes because he was concentrating on the sufficiency of Jesus as the source of his ultimate contentment. Because you see, suffering couldn't discourage Paul and persecution could not deter Paul and want could not deprive Paul and prison could not detain Paul. You say, John, that's not true. Prison did detain Paul. Only his body, not his spirit, because it was in prison while he was chained, incarcerated, that he wrote this letter to you and I, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that you can be chained in difficult circumstances and not be a captive at all if you understand the freedom that we have in Christ? Paul's demonstrating that for us right now. 
So, I mean, how do you beat a guy like this, right? You can't deprive him because he's content. If you stone him and try to kill him, it doesn't matter because God will heal him and he'll get back up and start preaching again. If you imprison him, he'll only start singing praises to God about the midnight hour. I mean, Paul has a contentment that he's showing us that is not the normal thing in our world today. It's, it's not normal as our culture goes. He has learned this contentment because he has learned the liberating principle of God sufficiency. Some of you have relied on your family's material legacy or your own intellect and academic vocational accomplishment and your self-sufficiency. And certainly, in balance, those things are very honorable and very good. But at the end of the day, in very real terms, we won't be free until we are totally God-sufficient. Because when we come to the point in life when Jesus is all we have, it's at that point that we will discover that Jesus is all we need. Now, we like that statement, but what you and I won't like is the pain that it took to realize that. You're right? You understand what I'm saying? When Jesus is all we have, that means circumstances are probably grim and dark and difficult. And it's in that difficult moment that we'll discover Christ is all we need, the sufficiency of Christ. But it takes that dark, difficult moment to get us to the point where we begin to embrace God's sufficiency. And Paul's demonstrating this for us uh, in a, uh, Philippians chapter 4. Now, hear this important insight. If we do not learn contentment in life, then enough will never be enough. You will never make enough at your job. You'll never have a cool enough husband or wife. Your kids are never gonna be good enough for you. You'll never have enough professional accolades. You'll never yet have all the toys parked in your garage or the cool, hot vacations that are the envy of everybody on social media. If we live with this constant nagging discontentment that says, I've gotta get more and more and more to validate myself, to prove to others that I am something, uh, I just say to you with love, dude, that is so a dead end road. You are gonna kill yourself along the way because if we don't learn contentment, enough will never be enough because here's the deal with money. Don't forget it. Money only makes us more of what we already are. You understand that? How does that feel that if what you and I are right now, what you and I are right now was greatly amplified for all to see and that was possible only because we had more mammon, more material resource. Money doesn't make us better or worse or even different. It only makes us more of what we already are. And so that's why learning contentment is absolutely critical. Two things are going on in our three verses today. There's two groups of people on sort of the socioeconomic grid. The first group are people that are in need and don't have enough and live pretty, in some sense, minimal Spartan lives. On the other end are those that actually have plenty and are well-fed and have an abundance. And the case that Paul is making, and we're gonna unpack both of those scenarios, the case that Paul is making is you can live for God in both contexts. Do not fall, I've heard for decades uh, in Christian culture this idea that if you are a person of wealth, you're automatically sinful, and if you're a poor, 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 a poor person, you're automatically spiritual. That is not true. That's absolutely not in the Bible. You can be spiritual or unspiritual with minimal means, spiritual or unspiritual with abundant means. It's what's in our heart that defines what we are, and we really can't ever judge what's in any other person's heart. Only God knows. So let's not judge one another. So let's talk about humble means, and let's talk about the dangers of affluence and how to uh, become a person of contented affluence and keep this kind of contextual caveat in mind. America's about five to 6% of the planet's population, seven and a half billion people, right? and we consume over 40% of all the planet's goods and resources. Did you get that? 
So if, in fact, we believe what the Bible teaches, that all seven and a half billion people are created in the image of God, and God loves us all equally, red and yellow, black and white, every nation, tribe, tongue, so forth, America and Americans, no matter how much we think we have or do not have, or where we may place ourselves on the economic grid based upon our annual household income, we are wildly wealthy compared to our brothers and sisters on the rest of the planet, our fellow human beings. Please do keep that contextually in mind, because if we just look at this passage through an American lens, it will be distorted. Okay. Having said that, let's talk about the benefit of humble means. And Paul defines this in our verses as people that are in need or hungry or in want. But the Bible says don't be overwhelmed if that may in some sense define you because there are some benefits to humble means. And there are five. Here's one of them. Fill it in. People of humble means have learned how to live with dependence on God. How much the Bible says, Book of Proverbs, many other places, the Bible demonstrates that one of the dangers of affluence is we are self-dependent and honestly smugness and even arrogance and self-congratulation, narcissism and so can creep in. But when we live with minimal means, we look to the Lord as our provider and actually that's a very good place to be. Because in the Bible, we see miraculous provision story after miraculous provision story of God caring for people of humble means. And God loves it when we're dependent upon him with a childlike dependence upon his dependability. When that happens, he is glorified and we are satisfied. Does that make sense? There's a second value of humble means, and it's this. People of humble means have learned to appreciate the beauty of healthy relationships in the body of Christ, in the church, in the family of God. The Bible demonstrates from the earliest pages of the New Testament when the church emerged, God's wisdom in his faith families, his local churches, that we are interdependent. Now, some of you, you may not like that. But here's what the Bible teaches us when we are all in. Here it is, four words. We need each other. Say that with me, everybody. We need each other. Now, I know as independent, self-reliant Americans, we don't like the idea of needing each other. And it's not so much that we're going to need somebody else, but somebody else may need us, and we don't want them pestering us and begging from us and bugging us and inconveniencing us or making us uncomfortable, right? Now, we are interdependent and in need of each other with the sharing of material resources, the sharing of spiritual gifts. We complete one another, relationships making us whole and so forth. And I mean, in this faith family, the Bay Church, I could give you a thousand examples of people sharing and caring and being interdependent. We don't have the time. I've jotted down just a few. Uh, Widows and the elderly being generously cared for. Uh, Cars being given to single mothers. The hungry being fully fed, the needy being clothed, sacrificial giving to the future expansion of this ministry so we can reach all the bay, rent uh, costs provided for, medicine and medical costs provided for, youth and children, scholarship to camp. I mean, the underserved, the homeless, victims, traffic, widow, orphan, children, all of them are cared for by all of you not even on a weekly or monthly basis, on a daily basis in this living, throbbing culture, this faith family called the Bay Church. And that's what healthy relationships do with this healthy interdependency. Now, there's some verses I'm gonna need you to write down in addition to what's in your notes. Here's one of them. Acts chapter two, verse 44. Acts two, 44. Please write that down. The Bible says all the believers were together They had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. It's the Bible. There's a third reason uh, that humble means are of great value, and that's because it leads to less cluttered lives. That's number three. In other words, there is blessing to not owning very much. And here's why. It's called the tyranny of ownership. Have you experienced the tyranny of ownership? In other words, the tyranny of once you've got it, it got you. 
You say, John, what is it? It is anything we've coveted to have or craved to have. Once we've got it, it got us because we've got to oil it and tighten it and repair it. We've got to wash it, wax it, paint it, protect it, worry about it, insure it, make payments on it, obsess over it. Because what stuff does to the human soul and spirit is it dominates, dictates, and demands. And when we are individuals of humble means, depending deeply on God, living in healthy interdependence as the family of God, uh, then we can begin to live less cluttered lives in the true beauty of simplicity. There is a biblical case, and it's demonstrated with laser clarity in the life of Jesus himself, the beauty and simplicity of the uncluttered life. Uncluttered lives are streamlined lives. Uh, They are men and women who are difference makers for Christ rather than being tyrannized by all the stuff that really doesn't matter. There's a fourth value of humble means. Fill it in. Humble uh, people of humble means readily identify with the poor. People of wealth, it's it's a greater challenge for them to identify with the poor. Here's another of those verses I need you to write down. Luke chapter 16. In Luke 16 is included this incredible, honestly searing story of the rich man and Lazarus. And if you haven't read it lately, you need to read it again. And it is a most sobering reminder. Because the rich man in this life had it all, dude. And Lazarus was so impoverished and of such humble means, he was looking for scraps that had fallen below the table after the meals before the dogs got him. In the next life, when both the rich man and Lazarus had died, their roles had changed 180. And it is sobering indeed. People of humble means readily identify with the poor. So here is a fact that is shocking but true. In the United States today, in terms of socioeconomic uh, per capita household income, people of humbler means give a far larger percentage of their annual income to charity, their church, whatever, than do the affluent. You're saying, John, how can that be possible? that poorer people or people with less means are more generous than people with abundant material means because that's the seduction of what the material does to the human soul. Enough never becomes enough and we buy into the myth of more. We have convinced ourselves is more is what we need to make ourselves truly happy. There's a fifth Uh, And it's this, people of humble means have a heightened longing for heaven. They do. It's not that they don't love their life on this earth and their life in Christ on this earth, but they are simply not entrenched or obsessed to the cares, concerns, and commodities of this transient life. And they engage in the things of the kingdom. And it's far easier for them to seek first the kingdom of God than be connected and ensnared and hooked from the deceitfulness of this passing age. And so they live with a heightened longing and focus on the next life. So those are five benefits that you might not have thought of before of being a person of humbler means or more minimal material resource. Let's talk for a moment about sort of the perils of affluence and then how you can be a person of wealth uh, or a person of disproportionate means and be truly spiritual. You know I love history and so this is a true story and it happened in the United States in Chicago in 1929 when nine of the world's most successful money-making businessmen got together at the Edgewater Hotel in Chicago. So in 1929, these nine individuals are riding high. They were the billionaires, trillionaires of the era. They had the world by the tail. And then history tracks them 25 years later, but something happened in that 25-year period. Uh, if you're familiar with America, you, you may, American history, you may be familiar with something called the 
Teapot Dome Scandal. If you're not familiar with the Teapot Dome Scandal, Google it later today, check it out. The Teapot Dome Scandal happened to these nine individuals, and they were very implicated in it, and then something else happened in October of uh, 1929, and that's called the crash of Wall Street and the beginning of the Great Depression. Okay, so those two things happened. So these nine guys that are basically running the planet in 1929, what's become of their lives 25 years later? True story, check it out. 25 years later, where were these individuals of fantastic wealth and power? Well, Ivor Kruger, who was head of the greatest monopoly in the world, died of suicide. Jesse Livermore, the most successful speculator on Wall Street history, died of suicide. Charles Schwab, president of the largest independent steel company, died in bankruptcy and lived on borrowed money for the last five years before he died. Samuel Insull, the president of the greatest utility company in the world, died a fugitive from the law, penniless in a foreign land. Howard Hobson, president of the largest gas company, went insane and was institutionalized. Arthur Cotton, the greatest wheat speculator, died abroad bankrupt. Richard Whitney, president of the New York Stock Exchange, was finally released from Sing Sing Penitentiary. Leon Frazier, president of the Bank of International Settlements, died of suicide. Albert Fall, a member of the president's cabinet was pardoned from prison so that he could, go to, he could go home to die. Now, this author says, what's the moral of this little story? Well, it could be that money doesn't bring happiness. But on the other hand, these individuals may have been very happy while they had money. Uh, maybe it's that riches are transient, that it's difficult to keep them. But some families do keep them for generations. What it really was, was the Teapot Dome scandal and the Great Depression back to pack that robbed these men of their immense wealth. Because the real story is that when their money went, so did they. When their money went, so were they. For the rest of the world, the sun kept shining, the flowers kept blooming, multitudes of common people all over the world pulled in their belts a little tighter and went on living, but these individuals were destroyed. Why? Because they had lives centered exclusively on money, and when it, when it was gone, they were gone, they had nothing left to live for. Notice that summary sentence, when it was gone, they were gone. When it was gone, they were gone because they had no life outside of money or material things. Now, friends, what Jesus is urging us through all of his life and ministry is to, to remember to travel lightly, that this world is not our home, that we are only pilgrims passing through, that more is not the answer, it is a lie. That money and matter can never satisfy the human spirit. We are spiritual beings, and things materially can never fully satisfy the deepest yearnings and longings of our spiritual essence. Let's wrap up this morning's Bible study by talking about how to be a person of contented affluence, how to have plenty, how to be well-fed without it eroding our spiritual life, how to have wealth and not be greedy for more, right? Here's another of those verses I want you to write down. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says this, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. Do you know that that last sentence is exactly what's happened in my life in the last six weeks? Because six weeks ago, I laid my dear mom at rest. She died at age 81. I've shared that with you. I looked when she left me. She had nothing in her hands. Because there is nothing that we can take from this life into the next life. Absolutely nothing except one thing a life lived for God. Then on this idea, we brought nothing into the world, another beautiful woman is born into my life, Ellie, who I've just shared with you. And I checked it out when she arrived. She had nothing in her little hands. 
She arrived in the way that all babies arrived. She was red and wrinkled and screaming at the top of her lungs and totally poor and had nothing to bring with her. In other words, when the Bible says we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it, my mama and Ellie remind me and all of us that this is precisely true. So how do we live lives of contented affluence? I want to say to you in context that wealth or being wealthy is not a sin. And that money in and of itself, inherently, is not evil. The Bible doesn't say that money is evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So when we begin to lust for, love, worship, and revere money and things material in ways that God never intended, we begin to become spiritually undone and begin to spiral off into all kinds of lunatic fringe craziness. You can be wealthy and godly or wealthy and a sinner. You can be poor and godly or poor and a sinner. It doesn't make a difference of our socioeconomic status. It is about the set of our heart. So how can we be contented and affluent? Number one, uh, contented and affluent people view their affluence not as their own, but as an entrustment from God that must be carefully stewarded. In other words, they're not trying to become wealthy or flaunt their resources. They're acknowledging God as their provider. They live with a keen sense of sobering accountability. Now here's another one of those verses I'd like you to write down, if you would please. Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus Christ said, to whom much is given, much will be required. See, life is not I own. It is only on loan. And if we have been entrusted with much materially, it's not for our own narcissistic gratification. It's that we might leverage these entrustments to do the will of God, to be a blessing in the world, to be a fully devoted Christ follower, to remember the widow and the orphan. <clears throat> the most dangerous kind of wealth, and I feel I must need to say this, not because it's any problem in our church, but because it continues to be a problem with the human race. And that's this, that it takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. What do you mean a steady hand? Character. Character. And the most dangerous kind of wealth is inherited wealth. Please remember this. <clears throat> because people who did absolutely nothing for the wealth that is now theirs, they simply had the good roll of the dice in the birthing lottery with the right last name, and now all this wealth that they didn't work a day for, didn't have any skill, ability, or any, they simply receive it because of the prosperity and the success of their parents, grandparents, and so forth. I say to us, this is a, a needed reminder that we are very careful to put first things first and to build character in our sons and daughters. Make sure that we are tending to matters of the heart with our children. Be strong on principle, deeply, unconditionally loving toward your children and toward their best lifelong interest. It takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. The second thing for contented, affluent people is this you're going to find that they'll develop a gradual loss of obsession for the things of this world. Write this verse down, an additional, most important verse, Luke 12, 15. Jesus Christ said in Luke 12, 15, beware of every form of greed because a person's life does not consist of the abundance of their possessions. 
contented, affluent people at some point are going to say, I do not need any more expensive incidentals to amuse myself. Enough is enough. This stuff is beginning to weigh me down and distract me from my ultimate purpose in this life of glorifying God through my days on this earth. No more. Enough is enough. I'm going to pass on these good things to those in need. I love the words of Garrison Keillor. He said, some luck lies in not getting what you thought you wanted, but in fact getting what you already have, which once you've got it, you may be smart enough to see is what you would have wanted had you known. Did you get that? I didn't get it either. Think about it. It's good. Let's go on to number three. Third thing about contented affluence is this. Contented, affluent people love to give to the work of the Lord because they know that doing so makes a big difference in eternity. I said the only thing in this life to the next life that we can take with us is a life lived for God, and that's the same with material affluence. The only result or good or enduring value of our money, resources, our financial bottom line from this life to the next life are those monies that we invested in the things of the kingdom of God, which is to say human beings, because only human beings will make it from this side, this dimension of reality, to the other side, the next dimension of reality in the afterlife. To that end, that's why God has given us the beautiful gift of the tithe. God doesn't need our tithe. We need to tithe. Because when we tithe, here's what we are reminded. Wait a minute. I'm not the owner. I am only the manager. Wait a minute. I am not my own provider and my own source. The Lord is my provider. All good things come from my Father in heaven. I am merely a temporary custodian of a sacred trust and a recipient of his incredible generosity in my life. For those of you that have not yet begun to give, we have something around this place called 90 Day Giving Challenge. This is very private, very personal, only between you and God. You will not be asked about it. Little cards that look like this are in the seat back in front of you, and it's a simple little tool to get you going, and that for 90 days, so let's just say the summer, June, July, and August, we begin to worship God with giving. Now, many of you that are not giving, you could not start with the tithe. You know why your, your financial realities simply make that impossible. But start with something, maybe 1%, 2%, 5%. Because God looks at the heart. And then take that class which is so popular in our culture, financial peace, because we help people with biblical principle get their financial house in order and set them free. Take this little card and you'll notice it's perforated in the middle. Uh, sign it at the bottom and stuff, check the appropriate box and put it in one of the, the little buckets when you're exiting the worship center here in a few moments. Keep the top part for yourself as a reminder. You say, John, what's gonna happen with it? Nothing. It's between you and God. The cards will be given to me as your pastor. I don't even look at names. I don't even really care to. It doesn't matter to me. But I will stack that stack of 90-day giving challenge cards where people that begin to set them free by worship, themselves free by worshiping God with the tithe. I will put that on my desk and I will pray for you every day. And not just for financial and material provision, but God's provision for you in every area of your life in your work, in the rearing of your children, in your marriage, in all these areas of your life, you understand there's far greater wealth in life than financial wealth. Far greater wealth in life than financial wealth. So people of contented affluence understand that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. Let's look at this passage one more time. And in fact, I'm going to have you close your eyes and I want to read it to you because I think that verses 10, 11, and 12 are going to mean something very different to you now than they meant about 30 minutes ago when we began this Bible study together. That whether we are rich or poor, plenty or want, we can serve and honor God fully. And with your eyes closed and your ears wide open, listen deeply. The Word of God says... 
for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then I add next week's verse, verse 13, for next weekend's Bible study, Paul concludes, for I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And everyone said, stand to your feet, would you please, for closing prayer.